My name is Oliver Picard and I play with classic cars on some of the world's most beautiful roads for a living. That Porsche rear engine blood shining through. In 2020, I went to Retromobile Paris and saw some of the most exquisite, handmade, hand-finished and expensive cars on the planet. On returning home, the pandemic hit and I decided that the time for dreaming was done. I wanted to build my dream. I wanted to build the car that I had been designing since childhood. So with the help of my aerospace engineer and rallyist father, Andrew, we set about trying to find the perfect project. We found it rotting in a side yard in Normandy. Crashed, twisted, broken, buckled and fire damaged, a GTM. We dragged it home and tore it apart. Re-engineered from the ground up. Engine, suspension, fuel system, drivetrain, even the seating position. Everything. Bespoke, one of one. This is Project Mosquito. Hello. Hello. Right. Good morning. Good morning. It's, uh, it's a fresh day in the workshop. We've had a little bit of a break as well because it's been snowing in April for reasons we're not quite sure of, but it's been snowing and freezing. It went from like 25, 20... Yeah, 25 degrees last week. To, to, to minus five. five and snowing and blizzards. And I actually went to upload last week's video in my little 2CV in a blizzard. And uh, she did incredibly well. 18 horsepower in a blizzard. We were the only car on the road. She's 60 year old nearly. And she didn't miss a beat, my lovely little 2CV. So now, fortunately, the snow is gone yep. and it's nearly 25 it's degrees again. Shining, <laughs> well, hopefully it's going to be 25 degrees yeah. today. So we had a break, we had a couple of days off because, like, sod being in here when it's freezing cold. <laughs> <laughs> I love this car and I love making these videos, but not when it's minus five. I've done that before and it's miserable. Yeah, no fun at all. No. So what we're we doing today then? So today we're going to, well we've already removed the suspension from that side and we're going to take the engine out, lift the chassis off and put it on the turbo. Because we need to weld up what we've already started and finish it completely. Yeah. Because we don't want to move on to another, uh, to the other side until this side's finished. Otherwise we end up with tons and tons of welding and everything half finished. Yep. So and that's what we're going to do. There's a lot of, a lot of little bits to do and if, for those who are new to the channel, hello new people, um, the way that this car is being built is we're building it in a way that we can take it apart and put it back together again because it is so small, hence the name Mosquito, um, she's teeny teeny tiny and very buzzy and so like things like the sills which are over there, they come off, the centre tunnel comes out and that way we can just lift it off the engine because the engine drops out the bottom because being a mid-engine car, Taking the engine out the top is like trying to fit a watermelon through a post box. Um, don't work. Don't work. So yeah, that's what we're going to do. Engine out and uh, get melting some metal. Yeah. Let's crack on. Let's crack on. Ah, you got it. Take this one out. Could you made it tighter? <laughs> oh, she pops. Everything off. Yep. Straight. Oh, hang on. Ah, right. Hang on, to me, to me, to me, to me, to me. Front mount is catching. Right, that way, that's it. No, hang on there. Oh, 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 my end up, there you go. Well, that was smoother than last time. <laughs> Yay. <sighs> So now we can see, everything's much easier to get at. We can flip it over, we can do what we want now. So all this needs welding, this, this. 
or this, this side. And this temporary gusset here needs temporary. remaking completely. That was just put in last week for uh, a placeholder because you couldn't get in, could you? No. So it's there for a bit of stability while we worked everything out. Tell you what, it's very pretty when it's on a table. It also looks very, very small. What follows is a brief construction montage. A few people have asked how we're going to find our shock mounting position and the answer is it's going to be variable. So we've mounted up our suspension and now we need to make a mount where we can actually move our shock up and down so we have a second ride height adjuster because you can adjust your ride height a little bit with your preload of your spring so basically with these collars on the spring itself by clamping those down but that also adjusts your spring rate because you're putting more tension into the spring and so without messing with preload we want a little bit of adjustment as well just so we can get it spot on so now we need to make a mount that has multiple holes in it so that this shock can move up and down and uh, adjust our ride height
して。I'm trying to get it up with it and stop. Being off road shocks, as you get towards them, it's not. They get rough and stiff. Hope you enjoyed this brief construction montage. It's been really easy making this, uh, making this suspension mount because I haven't done it. It's great. It's lovely watching someone else work yeah. for a change. It's not, it's not a thing I've ever had the pleasure of seeing. Yeah, all right. I made them bottom plates for you, you bugger. Yeah, right. I did. I've got camera evidence of it and everything. Cool, it? it no longer looks like a really weird climbing frame. Because no. for a while there, it could have been hung in the tape modern. Now, it, now, I, I've said in every single video for ages. Oh no, it's beginning to look like a car. It's more and more like a car every single day. Because in my head, it is. Like I can see it, and I've I've been able to see it since it was a hoop. <laughs> like we welded legs on on the on a hoop and I went, oh it's beginning to look like a car because I can see it but I know for everybody who isn't me it's uh somewhat challenging right um good morning it's two days later two days yep uh, day and a half later and we're in a massive thunderstorm. Um, so we start off with snow and we're ending it with thunder. Uh, I'm huge about it. Massive windstorm. Yeah. And as as many of you have noticed, our barn doors are kind of... Not, not how they should be. Not wind resistant. <laughs> they, they, they have the wind resistance of a tea strainer. So it's actually too windy in the workshop to weld. This <laughs> this is not a normal people problem. No. So what, what we decided to do is, is, an, is answer some questions. Yeah. Well, we're just going to have a have a natter about it, aren't we? Yeah. But I'd, I'd first like to start off by saying, well done with your bracketry, sir. Well, you're very, very much welcome. I um, I'm really proud of it. It's awesome. Yeah. And we're one up on Lotus Europa people because Lotus Europa people, you know, they're like they all like to show off. Oh, my engine mount's also a suspension mount. Well, ours is a shock mount, an engine mount, and a suspension mount. All in one. Yeah. So take that, Colin. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. So I, I got a couple of interesting questions. Okay. So firstly, because uh, I've I've realised that people really like seeing you rant about things. Uh, <laughs> that that does well apparently on the on the algorithm. Uh, so Robert Coffrey uh, compares our car to Binky. And it, well, I'm not going to read his whole comment because it's like war and peace. Right. So basically, it's not like Binky at all. Dad doesn't, fact, like, Dad doesn't like Binky. Right, because <laughs> it's twice the weight. Yeah. Bin no, Binky is twice the weight Binky, of our car. Binky is twice the weight. It's, and it's four drive and turbo. And what I, what I actually like to do mm -hmm. is, is take the Mosquito mm -hmm. to a track with Binky. Yeah. And do a 20 lap. 20 non-stop laps. I'd also like to put them both down a really long country road. Something like butter tubs or something like that. Mm -hmm. Because, but like I said, Binky is shorter in wheelbase, but it's also much, much heavier. I, I appreciate Binky, but it's really not my style. No. And I've, as I get older, I've, I'm learning to appreciate people's car. When I was younger, I was like, ah, oh, oh, car's a piece of rubbish. It's not a piece of rubbish, Binky. It's it's a quality made thing. But what I mean is, as I'm getting older, I'm learning to appreciate other people's joy in their cars, even if it's not my thing. Yeah. So like Morris Marina people, I just hope you're happy. You know what I mean? <laughs> as long as you're happy, I'm happy. Um, it's not my taste. It's not my car. So it doesn't matter. And my car's not other people's taste. And that doesn't matter. 
But Binky is incredibly heavy, and it's really not our style, is it? No. It's far too, it's like, it's far too heavy. I'd like to see it when it, it's, we run for 10 laps and see how heat soaked it all gets. Yeah. And whether it actually just breaks down. No, I don't think it would, but I think it wouldn't. It would start with very different horsepower than it finished. Yeah. As, as turbos do. But um, that, it's, it's very, very complicated. And you've got a, modifi- a modified bit added to a modified bit added to a modified bit added to a modified bit, yeah. which in the UK, when you're never far from home, isn't so bad. No. But what we've tried to do with the Mosquito is make it so basically wherever you are in the world, if you do have a problem, you can fix it. Yeah, it's all OEM bits. So like the front suspension being Mazda, where I can order stuff online from either, or just go to a Mazda dealership or Honda bits I can get online or whatever. Um, you know, it's all designed to be fixed. It's all designed to be repaired. We've taken that into consideration. But I, Binky's just a very different thing. It's a very different style of making cars. Yeah, even though they both started off as minis. Yeah, they did. I, and actually, mechanically, the... <laughs> the Mosquito is more mini because it uses a mini steering rack than <laughs> the Binky is because yeah. Binky uses a, a modified Celica well, rack. Binky is a Celica put into yeah. a, on, mini, a mini on, shaped I think object. As far as like the laws in the UK, people are obsessed with paperwork, which I'll never understand. A lot of people in the comments uh, talk about our car and paperwork, but Binky on paper is a Celica, not a mini. Um, that's how that works. But no, it, it, it's one of those things. It's it's someone else's uh, it's someone else's dream. It's someone else's design, and that's an amazing thing that they're living their dream. And, 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 that, and they've, they've actually gone and done it. Yeah. Which because is, a lot of people all, talk about it, and not a lot of people do it. Yeah. All credit to it. Yeah. You know, they've actually gone there. They've, they've made what they set out to make. Well, it, it is a nice thing. They haven't made it yet because it's. I think the current having electrical issues. Is that because it's too complicated? Yes. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, it's not my taste, it's not your taste, no. but... It's one of the reasons why we drive I appreciate two it. TVs and Diane's. Yeah. Because the very thing is, if you've got a car that's only got 36 horsepower, right, and... 36? I'm on 18, sir. I'm all but... I'm posh. The, the I'm, be, the, I'm posh, I've got all the power. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it, I, I, it's quality over quantity. Right. <laughs> so, so basically, if you've got a car that's only got either 18 or 36 horsepower, um, you've got to use every single one of those horsepower. Yeah. So it makes it a lot of fun to drive. Yeah. So on the roads that we have here, which are super tight, super twisty, and you've only got a car, you can't have a... If you've got a car with 400 horsepower and it's a straight, you can basically make up the time you've lost by cocking up a corner. Well, the thing is, if your car weighs 1,200 kilos, you need 400 horsepower. Yeah. Because what a lot of people don't seem to have realised is that Binky and... The Mosquito have roughly the same power to weight ratio. Now, in a straight line, they should be as fast as each other. Uh, but when it comes to a corner, Binky has twice the inertia and it's on smaller wheels. So it has less actual contact patch. So it needs that four-wheel drive system. What I would like to know is it, when you shorten the wheelbase, does the four-wheel drive system start fighting each other? Like, do different wheels start fighting each other? Because, so. yeah. And then does it get a bit... Um, but it's an interesting car. And a lot of people have asked us as well, you and I, about the fact that we seem very in tune with each other. Um, that's probably something to do with the fact that we've spent the last, like, 32 years together. Because <laughs> 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 you're my dad. Um, and that we seem to be very, like, on the same page as far as the Mosquito. Yeah. But we've got very different tastes, and I don't think people realise that. Like, our personal tastes are wildly different. Yeah. Um, dad loves for example dad loves the Alpine A110 the original one and I would buy a 310 because I, I'm cheap and I couldn't bring myself to spend that much money on basically the same car <laughs> in fact the, three ten, the, the 1800 310 is actually a better car yeah I know because it doesn't have the, the swing axles yeah and it's it half the price of an yeah. A110 and it has <laughs> no, so the, the 310 has got double, double wishbone back suspension yeah a, and a fit in it yeah. Which is a thing, yeah. <laughs> but we've got ver- we have a very similar taste in cars, but also incredibly different. Yeah, um, we've like we both like we both have huge collections of vintage suits, but our collection our suits are wildly different. Yeah, um, we are, we are very similar, but also wildly different from each other, and I think that also creates and we're both massively competitive. Which I think creates, um, it, we are, aren't we? Yeah. 
and I think that creates a really good atmosphere where we're both pushing each other all the time. Yeah. But it's always in a good way. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's always out of love, and we're all like we're always trying to better each other and and trying to. And I think that's a really well, awesome which, thing. Which is causes a bit of a problem because we're also building uh, two houses, two yeah. off-grid houses. We've got a, an <laughs> off-grid workshop which we produce all our own power, yeah. all our own solar power. That's why it, we haven't built barn doors yet. Which we're, <laughs> we're, we're so busy, we're so so busy doing do. the mosquito and two houses and rewiring and plumbing and gardening and yeah. all the other things that go into being self-sufficient and living in an off-grid house yeah. or two off-grid houses. But uh, we get up at six in the morning. Uh, six? Luxury? Sleeping bugger? Oh, I'm, I'm up at five o'clock every morning. A lot of people you. ask who edits these videos. I do, and I do it in my pyjamas with a cup of coffee in my hand at five o'clock in the morning, every morning. <laughs> so I get up, we get up at six and we basically go to when it goes dark. Yeah. And then if I'm uploading, I'm coming home in the dark. In fact, in, you, in the earlier, earlier in this video, you can see the... the all of the going because we don't need no internet. We live so no. rurally, we don't have normal internet. And they've got a phone line. Actually, we should be getting uh, broadband in 2004, which that's something 2000, to look 2004? Yeah, that's something to look forward to, isn't it? Well, in 2004, when we get broadband, according to the French government, that bit, that'll be great. <laughs> um, well, no, they promised us last year. No, they promised, a, they promised the village broadband in 2004. Yeah. And if you look at if this is in if you're watching this in the future, it's currently 2022. <laughs> so bang on schedule. Yeah. Um, but we, I think it's important that people know like how we how we came to be as kind of us, because like my love for cars comes from you. I came home from the hospital um, after being born in a in an Alpine powered Renault 12. Yep. And when I came home from nursery school, like dad dad used to pick me up from nursery school when I, when I was little. And instead of like Sesame Street, I got rally videos. I got um, like VHS rally videos, Italian job, <laughs> Le Mans. It was like it was everything. It was I never stood a chance. <laughs> so you're responsible for, yep. for all of this. I take full responsibility. And, and then we've worked together for years. Um, when you stopped doing engineering stuff and you moved away from the UK, and I obviously moved away from the UK, when we started working, I worked kind of on my own doing boat stuff, and then we ended up working together, didn't we, after yeah. a bit? We did mar marine stainless steel. And... Uh, and restoration and fabrication and yeah. all sorts. We didn't just do stainless steel. Oh no, we, well, in fact we had a, <laughs> we, we, did, we did a full restoration on a, a 16 metre multi yacht. Yeah. That's... Which now is actually a hotel. Yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in Gibraltar. Yeah, a 1960s oak uh, framed wooden multi yacht. It was gorgeous. And, and we, uh, did, we, we, could, we rebuilt it basically from the, the ground up. And we did my little boat as well. Yeah. Because in 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 uh, my my friend told me that he couldn't look after his boat anymore, so I ended, instead of buying a first car, I had a first yacht, and uh, <laughs> I ended up completely restoring a yacht that was covered in many coats of house paint. Oh, there's another question. Nikus Visser says he's trying to understand the ex uh, the suspension now. A lot of people didn't quite get it. Uh, what you were talking about with roll bars and not having a roll bar on the back and stuff. Right. So. Like I said in the, in the last video, if, if you put a really stiff bar between two sets of wishbones, you know, between two back wheels, between two back wheels, it's basically you're linking them together, so one wheel then affects the other one. So if you hit a bump with one and the anti roll bar goes up, it pushes down on the other side, so you're basically lifting the back of the car at one side. Right? So you want to avoid that. And the way to, the way to get around not having an anti roll bar, you have your centre of gravity. And your roll center if near they, each other. If they if they're together, what happens is when you go around the corner, basically the two links force each other together, and they cause a lifting effect and lift the back of the car up, which is not what you want. So you need to get your roll center and your, um, your center of gravity and your roll center. Your roll center needs to be slightly lower than your center of gravity. That way, you don't get the jacking effect from this when you go around the corner, and you don't get any roll. 
and the reason why people a lot of people who use um, either a trailing arm suspension or a, a McPherson strut suspension use a big anti-roll bar is that it, it doesn't just push up and down but an anti-roll bar also pushes out and if you have camber on your on your um, on your McPherson struts on your strut your your suspension follows the line of that strut so if you look at like a drift car or whatever and you see the strut inside the wheel well the suspension will follow the line of that strut it's the only way it can go so your car gets narrower in compression so when you compress both sides of the suspension you you track between your wheels actually it's narrower and what your big anti-roll bar does is it forces your suspension back out again and forces both wheels down which is terrible for grip but it does stop your car getting narrower and getting all twitchy and weird and in a mid-engine car your car getting narrower under compression causes some very scary Stratos uh, type handling doesn't it yeah. and when you watch old Stratoses if you go watch some old rally videos you'll notice that the back of a Stratos hardly moves around at all uh, the same with a, a Darien or a Davrian um, they, the back of that car does not move at all there's no give in that suspension it's all in the tyre and that's why Stratos is at the end of their run had these massive yeah, balloon tyres the, 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 the last one before they finished the group 5 cars yeah. were ridiculous and the teeny tiny skinny front tyres massive back tyres they were only 15 inch wheels and they were, they were almost 15 inch wide so all the grip is in the tyre not in the suspension and then when they went to the is it 037 yeah um all of a sudden they went to much less tyre because the 037 had a double wishbone set up so it could actually have suspension travel and then when you see that go around corners it actually has a bit of squat to it and a bit of roll and a bit of movement to yeah. its suspension it's not just this flat planted thing that all of a sudden does these big drifts huge thing that a lot of people don't understand and it's a huge thing with GTMs as well is that your car needs different roll centres front and back and a lot of people don't realise that your car needs a higher roll centre at the rear than it does at the front and that's because you want your car to, to turn around the nose the two very different things are front suspension and rear suspension yeah. and you do want an anti-roll bar at the front and we're going to have a very clever anti-roll bar at the front but we aren't going to have an anti-roll bar at the rear because we want the car to turn around the front of the car I know that's a funny thing to say but it's, it's something that might not be obvious to people that you actually you want your car to turn around the front of your car they tend to talk, turn around what's called the polar moment of inertia um, and when you've got a big long car and you've got kind of weights are far out they're very stable because just like um, and when you've got a very short car with the weight in the center it wants to turn around the center and it wants to kind of pirouette doesn't yep. it and well, so if you can move that that centre and that movement forward in your car rather than being in the middle then your car doesn't want to spin around its centre like a, like a, an ice skater coming out of a spinner yeah. like a, not like a, a traditional group 4 rally car right? what, what makes a good rally car a you good... say that like everybody knows what a traditional group 4 rally well, car you know, is like a, a, <laughs> we do like a group 4 S4 <laughs> yeah. or a 911 yeah right group... or an Alpine your weight's right. at one end. Your weight's always at one end, so you're pretty, it's predictable what your car's going to do. So if you're, I got a 911 or an Alpine, your engine's in the back, so you basically know what the car is always going to do because that's where the weight is. <laughs> With a Group 4 Escort, the weight's in the front, and you've enough power. But they do shift the engine as far back as they can to try and get it central. Yeah, and as low as possible to get the weight down as far as, like putting a, a dry sump BDA. In an escort, you can lower the engine massively and yeah. move it back. Yeah. So you get more, you get more treatment to the driving to the driven wheels. Yeah. But the 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 great thing about having that weight centrally is your suspension and your tyres, rather than having to deal with what the engine's doing and the weight in the car and the mass in the car, it just lets the weight sit in the centre and the the suspension do grip and the suspend and the tyres do grip because the more that you your suspension and your tyres have to deal with the less good that they are at actually drifting yeah. uh, at actually gripping sorry yeah. um, and, the, and it's, a, it's a massive subject we've, it is we've, we've got waffle on for flipping yeah. hours yeah and, and a lot of people want us to which is the weird thing <laughs> but um, yeah the, uh, Nick is visitor he says uh, he'd like to hear my father's opinion on twin engine cars can I take this one 
Well, hang on a minute. There used to be, in the, back in the UK, in the north of England, there used to be a guy that had a twin-engine Scirocco. Yeah, VW Scirocco. VW Scirocco. And it went really well. However. However. <laughs> right. The problem with mid-engine cars is the heaviest part of your car... Oh, sorry. The problem with twin-engine cars is the heaviest part of your car is the engine. Right? Unless you're fat and you've got a really light engine. But, apart from yourself... Your engine's the heaviest thing. And so if you double your engines, you're actually doubling the heaviest part of your car. So no matter what you do, you've got a heavy car. Uh, minis, in fact, are an excellent representation of the fact that it's really easy to take weight away from another part of the car that's not your engine. Yeah. So, like, you know, super lightweight mini guys will often show off by lifting the back of the car up. Yeah. Which is really funny because it makes for a terrible handling car to have a back end that's that light and a front end that, that that's that heavy. But it, it, having two engines, you're doubling your heaviest part of your car. You're also doubling your transmission loss. So the loss from the engine that goes through to your wheels, you, you're losing friction and stuff. And because you've got two gearboxes, you've got twice the transmission loss. So even if you've got two 250 horsepower engines, that does not make for 500 horsepower because... like. This engine will make um, 200 brake horsepower at the back tyres, should be, a little bit more. A bit more. Um, but that's, it, you know, at the crank, it's making, whatever, 260 or whatever. And so, if you did that in a, in a, a twin-engine car, obviously, you're not making as much power as you think you're making, because you've got twice that loss. And, because no two engines are identical to each other, you're always dragging one engine. Or pushing so, one engine. Or push, no, you're, yeah. So you've always got an engine braking effect that comes from your more powerful engine pushing your less powerful engine. Because unlike electric motors that can be tuned in to be exactly this strong, you can't do that with, a, with a, an engine. No. You know, they, they make engines in laboratories and stuff for Formula One and they still end up slightly different from each other, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, so that's it. Don't like it. Yeah, <laughs> and then you've got to and then you've got to find somewhere to fit a fuel tank. It's a, it is a bit of a nightmare when it comes to kind of all your packaging yeah. as well. And people end up like putting coolant lines in roll cages and all sorts, <laughs> which makes for a really hot car. They, twin engine cars have been tried a lot. There was um, there was the two CV um, the Mahara. Uh, there was two CV Sahara. Yeah. yeah. Um, which had an engine in the front and an engine in the back. There was a John Cooper made a twin engine mini with an engine in the front and an engine in the back and decided it were a terrible idea. Lots of people have done it through history. Uh, Ferrari actually did one for the Mont Ventoux hill climb, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a long time ago. Yeah, in the in the twenties, um, with with a an engine in the front and an engine in the back, so that it would be four wheel drive. But it's not. It's generally not a good idea, and that's why you don't see it. And these days, to be honest. Engines are so good now that you can get a thousand horsepower out of a single engine. Out of a single engine. Although you don't need it. No. You, well, what you need is no, what I'm the, the whole reason that five and two engines is to have more a power. hideous quantity of power and yeah. grip. So, but basically now engines are so good that you don't actually need a twin engine car at all because modern engines produce more than enough power. Yeah. But quite often a 300 horsepower car with a single engine will be far superior to a 700 horsepower car with two engines. Yeah. Like when you, when you actually get them on track and get them going, because of the weight difference and because you can actually balance a single engine car and because of the amount of fuel consumption and things like that. Well, not a big fan. No, but you can, you can cheat it with a DCT, but then you end up with a twin engine car that has two automatic gearboxes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's not a good idea. You're better just with a super, super light car that's super, super simple with a really good engine. Yeah. You know, I think we're missing out in a lot of ways in the car world at the moment because it's really easy to grab a headline with a super powerful engine. Yeah. If you make, and you know, it's really easy to make a YouTube thumbnail that says, oh, 450 horsepower K-Series or, you know, 1,000 horsepower 2JZ, when in the reality, the best 2JZ in the world makes... 450 horsepower is a hell of an engine but that engine is so much sweeter than making less horsepower yeah. and because power like gets headlines beautifully lightweight and simple cars get lost in the shuffle and that's sad um, 
I'm a huge fan of the 750 club racing, yeah. which is, <laughs> if you don't know about what Formula 750 is, Formula 750, they have a YouTube channel. It's really sad because they've got like 3,000 uh, 3, subscribers and they're going forever. And they do full commentated races. And they're superb. And they basically, they use little Fiat Panda engines in a little Formula car. And these are cars made in guys' sheds. And they're incredible. Yeah. And it's amazing how fast a little 750cc car can be. And, like, because we have such good engine technology now, you can get a heck of a lot of power out of a really small engine. Yeah. And I think we're really missing out on kind of a second... A second hurrah for the real lightweight car. Like in the 1960s, things like, you know, a lot of sevens and Caterhams and Europas and stuff like that, they became very much in, the, in vogue, didn't they? Yeah. You know, that late 60s, that's when, um, that's when the, the GTM was born. And kind of lightweight, really good handling cars were the focus of the day. And I think we're missing out on that now, especially with... Um, Cars like the Hummer EV. <laughs> I really, I'm good at making dad rant. Um, the Hummer EV that weighs 9,000 pounds. Yeah, ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, well, electric cars in general, right? When they start making enough power stations so you can, everybody can plug the car in, right? Then, yeah, great. Electric cars are fantastic. But you just think, you know, the, the, in the morning, the national grid dips because everybody turns to everybody because because everybody turns a kettle on in the UK. So you you imagine everybody coming home from work and plugging the car in. Yeah, uh, it's it's interesting. That it's it's also the thing of if every home right because in in France they've made oil central heating legal this from this year, haven't they? Yeah. And that's fine. That's a really good thing. Oil central heating is horribly polluting, um, but. The issue is that everyone then goes for electric. And if everybody's house is electric, and then everybody's car is electric, I mean, the U in the UK, the, the price of electricity has doubled yeah. in the last couple of months. And that puts a squeeze on absolutely everybody. Which is one of the reasons why we're, our house, our houses, are off-grid. Our completely. workshop is totally off-grid. Yeah. We, we produce all our own electricity. We're actually solar-powered, completely. But, um, but it's one of those things, if you have an issue and everything runs off the same system, we know this because we, are, we have multiple systems. Our heating system is not the same as our electricity system and that's not the same as our water system. And you need backups for things. Yeah. Because if every house is electric and then Everyone's every car, car is electric, is electric it ends up in a mess. Yeah. I mean, there was a there was a bridge collapse in Northern America um, somewhere, um, um, per, 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 North East yeah. somewhere. Anyway, um, a few months ago, last month or something, and they took jerry cans of fuel out to people, and people were stranded on a road, and they had to spend their nights in cars. And they took jerry cans of fuel out so people could stay alive in their cars in yeah. the freezing what? temperatures. Like, what would you do if you were in a Tesla? You'd end up sharing a back seat of like a Subaru with somebody <laughs> while you, while you, while you, well, your electric might, car just becomes yeah, a brick. I think that's a bit extreme, but it's... No, but that's, that extreme cases happen. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that one of our issues in the world is that we need these electric cars, kind of, because they do suit many people's needs. But the problem is that the automotive world wants to keep selling cars. And that's not the best thing, maybe. Maybe we're better with a lot less cars and a lot of people who shouldn't be driving anyway. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of terrible drivers out there who shouldn't be behind the wheel of a car. And uh, car enthusiasts are very different from people who have to get to work. And we need to separate the people who have to get to work from the car enthusiasts. Because a six-lane motorway is nobody's dream road, is it? Nope. Um, and we need to ask, you know, who needs to get to work? Do you really need to get to work? Can you work from home? Is an electric car right for you? Because in, in some cases, an electric car is way better for the environment, and in some cases, it's just greenwashing. It's just, it's worse for the environment because a Hummer EV is way, way, way worse than any fuel burning car. That <laughs> yeah, you're saying, well, if, like basically, you've got a, a 60 year old 2CV, for example. Yeah. 
right? The energy it took to make that car in the first place was very little. Was very little. And 60 years later, it's still on the road. <laughs> and the only thing it uses is some fuel. There was a study in it. Right. Um, there was a study into it, and they reckon that your average classic car in the UK uses the equivalent energy, in the equivalent carbon footprint of a laptop. Yeah. So it's the same carbon footprint as using a laptop. Whereas if you get a car, a brand new car, every three years, or and a car lasts now, 10 years maybe, and the reason that uh, car companies have spent so much time rust-proofing everything, is so basically your car can be recycled. Better, yeah. So well, look at Tesla people on Twitter. Like you're not on Twitter. You don't do social media, do you? No. But um, I don't even have a telephone. No. <laughs> but when you look at Tesla people on social media, they've all had like multiple Teslas. Yeah. Which is crazy. Because making that car last is kind of the whole point. <laughs> and from the second you're even even people are talking about like electric project cars and stuff like that now, which is kind of cool, but. From the second you get that battery pack, that battery pack has a sell-by date. Yeah. Whereas this, I mean, this engine has sat on this table now for over a year. And if it was an electric, if it was a battery pack, I'd be very worried. Because I'd be thinking, oh, I've only got so long to finish this car before I've got no battery pack. Yeah. Which is ridiculous, because see, you could, you could buy a battery pack that's a used battery pack from a Tesla. So it's been around a couple of years, then you get it. And, it, you know, it's got a 10-year lifespan or whatever. Yeah. So you might lose all your range. It's it's a very different world that we're entering in, and it's 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 very scary, really. But a lot of our parts, well, we've chosen on purpose a lot of our parts to be um, from other cars, so they're all recycled. Yep. So we can like not only can we fix the car, we're also recycling parts from other cars that have already been built and from, haven't had a life. Yeah. And basically, because we also even the, the welding we do on the car is powered by the sun. Yeah. So in producing this car, the carbon footprint is tiny yeah. in comparison and, to anything else. And uh, someone, in fact, someone said, as a 2CV owner, how can you want something like this? But this car will weigh less than the Diane. And it's way more aerodynamic. And so, because it will be so light and it will be so aerodynamic, pushing this car along will take very little power and so on a motorway out of VTEC this car should get well over 50 miles to the gallon yeah and uh, that like, should that should be kind of the minimum at yeah. this point it's like a 2 cv you know a little two twin cylinder engine if you if you could get get it fuel injected fit a catalytic converter to it and you will probably get which you can't in France you could you would probably get about 100 miles to the gallon mm. Right. If I could fuel inject Jolene, though, that'd be amazing. Yeah, because it'd run super sweet then. Mm. Perfect, but, perfect engine for fuel injection. Yeah, and I, if I could, if I could fuel inject that car and get over hundred miles to the gallon, I would do because that that would make me very, very happy. And you'd get a little bit more power as well. Yeah, which is nice because that that little sherry glass carburetor, as simple as it is, it's not the most precise thing in the world. <laughs> it's, uh, but like I said. I forget to put fuel in my 2CV, I keep a jerry can in the back of the car because it's so good on fuel. But I think a lot of people are talking about, you know, these low emissions areas in cities and stuff like that. And the reality is that cities are going to become pedestrianised very soon. Yeah. So it won't matter whether your car's low emissions or not. Um, you won't be able to take your car into a city anyway because the land under the road is now worth more than the road is. And, uh, and so everything's going to get pedestrianised. And... I don't like cities anyway. <laughs> I don't. I don't mind going, like, I like going to, yeah, it's just been retro mobile and Paris is cool and everything. But my goodness. Yeah. It's, it's a lot. And, and when I come home, I, it's, it's so relaxing. It's just the best thing ever. But, you know, you can understand it because we need, we need cycling infrastructure. We need, we need different ways for people to get around and more freedom of choice for people. I mean, my grandmother is in the UK, the, your, your mum, mm -hmm. uh, my grandparents are in the UK, and they, they've they cancelled the bus service to our village, haven't they? Yeah. And so my elderly grandparents are forced to drive, which is insane. Yeah. Um, because they shouldn't be driving too long. Um, but they're forced to drive because there's no other options. And, and no electric cars aren't going to sort that out. 
Nope. That's that's a world thing. And like, well, the thing is, for everybody to have an electric car is impossible because there isn't enough power stations. Yeah. Or wind farms or anything. They just the, the infrastructure isn't there for an electric car. No, and no, actually there is. For some people to have electric cars is an amazing thing. For some people who's you know, a perfect example is milk float. If you're not British, since the nineteen fifties, yep. a, a guy drives past your house every single day in a little electric trolley thing, delivers milk to your house, to your door. Best idea ever. Yeah. Right? Milk floats, genius. Local delivery by tiny electric vehicles that don't have to travel very far. Yep. Genius. Our local post in people fa- in, in villages. In, in, fact, Michael, in fact, in the Italian job, Michael Kane actually travels home on the back of a milk float. It does. It does. If you, so if you've never seen a milk float, there you go. But <laughs> um, no, but like in the here in our villages, yeah. our local post people use electric, electric vans, electric Renault Kangoos. But out of the villages, they use a little diesel yeah. because. Literally, the electric car can't do it. But I think for some things, it's really, really good. Yeah. And I think e-bikes are really, really good as well. Yeah. Um, e- e-cargo bikes. E-cargo bikes, brilliant. Fantastic for deliveries in cities. Yeah. So I think in some places, it makes loads and loads of sense. Yeah. But when it gets to kind of taking the mick a little bit, and when it when it becomes like Hummer EV, like it's just it's just wrong. stupid. <laughs> and you're just outsourcing your pollution to somewhere else. Because then it gets shipped to some third world country that then has to deal with it, yeah. and, and you know um, cobalt mining and all sorts. Yeah. It's all all a bit all anyway. a bit scary and sad. But yeah, that's a bit that's a bit <laughs> uh, bit depressing. <laughs> but like I said, I think we need a heyday of of super lightweight, super efficient cars. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to see the return of cycle cars. Like in the nineteen twenties, when you had a, a GN yeah. that was powered by a motorcycle engine, a GN, if you don't know. Weighed, um, I think weighed ninety eight kilos. Yeah, ridiculous to like. <laughs> like super, super like you know Morgan three wheels and stuff like that. The whole idea of the original Morgan three wheeler, they weighed nothing, and they had these teeny tiny little engines, and they could rail around corners because they carried speed well. And uh, I think we kind of need a return to that, and that's kind of something that we wanted to do with the Mosquito. That was kind of the point, wasn't it? Yep. It was a car we'd always dreamed of making. And it was something that, you know, it's very different from what anyone else is doing on YouTube. And I think that that's a good thing because I think people need something different. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a lot of like super powerful, super heavy cars out there and it's all just numbers. And it's, it's, it's good clickbait, but it's not the best car. So I hope you've all enjoyed this. Um, it's a bit of a weird one. but. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's one of those things, Dad and I are very, very different, and when I'm presenting videos, it always comes from my perspective, so it's kind of cool to hear your perspective, because you are, you're a very quiet person, but when, when you get going, <laughs> <laughs> no, we, Dad is a very quiet person, actually, the other day, I, I had to nip out, and I said to Dad, oh, you, you're all right filming, yeah? And he's like, yeah, 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 don't worry, I've got it, and I come back, and uh, I walk in. Uh, you filmed yeah 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 filmed everything it's fantastic and then there was like three and a half hours of completely silent engineering <laughs> you said that's what this mon- the montage from this video is um, but you just you are a quiet person aren't you yeah. but when you get going you, you're very I do, I, do, I do have an opinion oh yes um but yeah we are very very similar in a lot of ways and like the the the, the visage the visage is that the word the, the ethos for this car. Like a lot of people talk about the fact that we are very, very similar and we seem to have yeah. um, the same ethos when it comes to this car. But I think that's because we set out a really good design remit. Yeah, well, Not, it's, it's got to be small, it's got to be lightweight. Yeah, but and, also and, and, stylistically, we set out yeah. a very strict di- design remit and because we have very different tastes. Yeah. We have very, very different tastes in, in everything, even though they tend to be kind of a similar thing. Yeah. You go one way and I go the other way. And so when we set out on this, with this car, we set out a very strict design remit of what, what I wanted from the car, what the what the ethos was. We got a bunch of inspiration together and kind of, I know it sounds dorky, but we made a mood board. <laughs> um, I, I actually like mood boards and stuff, but they're really good motivation and they're really it's a really good thing to kind of Look at and keep you on track in it yeah. when you've got well, a project. We've said this before, though, you, you, and you've got a car that you can fix anywhere in the world. Yeah. 
where you don't need special tools, you don't need uh, a special workshop full of machinery and you can basically, if you do break down or for any reason, you can fix it at the side of the road. Yeah, definitely. Um, but like we set out a, a big mood board, be like all 1960s and 1970s cars yeah. and like little little design things that we both like and stuff like that and aircraft and all sorts. Yeah. And and then we coupled all of those things together and everything that we wanted f from this car and put together this. <laughs> or, or rather, we will do. When it stops being windy and we can actually get some welding done. So, thank you all for watching. Please be awesome with each other. Um, we enjoy your comments, don't we? Yeah, yeah, it's good fun. Like, Dad, not having a phone, <laughs> always, like, when I go over, he goes, oh, so, have we got any comments? And, uh, and I always have to, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, take the phone, read the comments. <laughs> um, but yeah, we always enjoy your comments, so thank you all for your comments, and thank you all for supporting this channel. We've had a massive increase in views over the last few days. Couple of weeks, yeah. And... Uh, it, it's one of those things where, because we're not in an English-speaking country, YouTube doesn't necessarily recommend us to all the people that it should recommend us to, and you sharing these videos has been massively, massively beneficial for this channel. So thank you all for helping us to build this car and uh, build this channel, and it's it's an amazing thing. So thank you all for watching. We should be hit, hitting 4,000 subscribers Yay. In, uh, in any day now. So thank you all for... Uh, Thank you all for that and thank you all for being here. And uh, we'll see you all in the next video. Bye-bye.